In the mid-1930s, there was a man named Casper who lived quietly with his family. He was a Dutch watchmaker who ran a family business, and he was known for an open and loving heart. He and his family were Christians, and they ministered to the downtrodden in the name of Christ without any regard to need or nationality. And toward the end of the 30s, the family's resolve to bless others endured what would become its greatest test. Their Holland home had always served as a home for anyone in need. But during World War II, their house became much more than just a place of hospitality. It became a hiding place for Jews and the Dutch underground. Casper Ten Boon and his two daughters, Betsy and Corey, were compelled by their faith to protect the Jews and others sought by the Nazis. At any given time, there were usually six or seven people living illegally in their safe house. On February 28, 1944, the Gestapo raided their home and they seized 30 refugees who came by that day, as well as Casper, his daughters, and three other relatives. All were arrested and imprisoned. The six people that were hidden in the false wall in Corey's bedroom remained quietly undetected for 47 hours until Dutch underground workers were able to free them. After only 10 days in prison, 84-year-old Casper died. When he was asked by another inmate if he knew he could die for helping Jews, he responded by saying this, it would be an honor to give my life for God's ancient people. Betsy and Corey spent 10 months in three different prisons sharing the love of Christ with other prisoners before Betsy died, as did her brother and nephew. Four ten boons gave their lives for protecting Jews against the venomous Nazis. Corey alone survived. The ten boons' vibrant faith gave them an understanding, I think, of God's upper story, including this deep love for God's chosen people. Now, what does that have to do with what you read this week? If you think about it, in chapter 20 of the story, the Jews faced similar circumstances 2,500 years before Adolf Hitler's reign of terror. As our story of Esther unfolds, we see anti-Semitism in its very worst form. But once again, we also see, we also see God's amazing provision for His people. I love the story of, it, of Esther. It's a different story than any other story in the Bible. I, I want to help you remember the main character. So let's use a deck of playing cards to identify the five main characters in Esther. Here we go. The king of clubs we'll call King Xerxes. He is king over all of Persia. The queen of diamonds will be Queen Vashti. She, she was married to the wealthy king. See what I did there, the diamond? Yeah, you jumped right on that. Thanks for that. Um, the, the queen of hearts will be Queen Esther because her story will touch your heart. See what I did there? You're enjoying this. I love this. And the joker, the joker will be Haman because he was constantly ridiculing the Jewish people. And then the ace of spades will be Mordecai. I like this. Because God's going to use him as an ace in the hole to get a lot of great things done with his people. Here's the story you read this week. King Xerxes had good reason to party. His vast empire was powerful and prosperous. His queen was lovely. His palace was ideal for a celebration befitting such a monarch. A celebration that lasted for six months. This guy knew how to party. Finally, the king summoned Queen Vashti to put her on display for all the drunken guests. I thought I'd be married to that guy. It's safe to say that she had been treated like arm candy for years, but this time no more. She refused. Big mistake. Kings don't like to be refused, so Xerxes stripped Vashti of her crown and banished her from his presence. Now, kings don't like to be embarrassed, but they also don't like to be queenless. That's not a word but you get the idea. So Xerxes commissioned a kingdom-wide beauty pageant, and young women from every province were whisked into the king's harem 
Instagram for a, check it out, a year-long visit at the Royal Spa. You read about that this week. And you guys think your wife takes a long time to get ready. <laughs> a year, an entire year of this extreme makeover. So this Jewish girl named Esther, who had been raised by her cousin Mordecai, enters the pageant. She won everyone's heart, including the king's. Xerxes made Esther queen, but didn't know she was a Jew. Soon after, Mordecai overheard a plot to kill the king. He passed the news to his cousin Esther, and the king was rescued, and the conspirators hanged. Fortunately, the royal scribe recorded Mordecai's service in the annals of the king, an event that would prove to be critical later. Again, the other central figure in the story is Haman, who was King Xerxes' right-hand man. Haman's head swelled in his high standing, and pretty soon he was loving the way all the royal officials knelt at his feet, everyone that is except Mordecai. Mordecai's a Jew, Haman's a descendant of Agag, Haman was enraged. His pride was so offended that to exact his revenge, Haman deceived the king into issuing a decree to exterminate Mordecai and all his people, the entire Jewish population of Persia. He cast a lot or a dice in the Hebrew, it's called pur, P-U-R, and he chose a single day of unrestricted violence against the Jews. Stay with me. Mordecai sent word to Esther, asking her to beg the king for mercy. This is where Gordon's scripture comes in. Queen Esther feared for her life because no one would legally go before the king without prior permission. But Mordecai's immortal words persuaded her. Who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And, and even greater than those words are, are Esther's courageous response. So if I perish, I perish. They prepared themselves for this dangerous mission the way God's people should. It was through prayer and fasting. We'll come back to that. When Esther approaches uninvited, Xerxes extends his scepter and says, make any request you want up to half my kingdom. And I can relate to that because that's exactly what I say to my wife Cassie when she comes into my office without first being summoned. <laughs> I say to her, come on in, sweetheart. Don't be afraid. Ask anything you want. I mean, up to half of this vast fortune and estate, it's yours, baby. And by the way, half of all my debt, that's yours as well. Well, anyway, she's not going to be in either service today, which is kind of why I use that. <laughs> Esther invited the king and Haman to two private banquets. Haman was elated to be the exclusive royal guest, but was still enraged over Mordecai's insolence. So he erects this pole on which Mordecai would be impelled. Kings with full stomachs must not sleep well. So Xerxes spent the midnight hours listening to the royal decrees. That's the equivalent of, when you can't sleep one night, just reading through the last several months of meeting minutes at elders' meetings. So he's just reading through the minutes of the previous board meetings, and he discovered the account of, of Mordecai's report that saved his own life and realized this act of loyalty had, had not been rewarded. How might he honor such a man? He puts this question to Haman for advice. Ironies of ironies. Arrogantly assuming that he was the king's favorite, Haman dreamed up an elaborate ceremony, but within moments, through clenched teeth, Haman was giving his nemesis the king's ropes, leading him through the streets and singing the praises of Mordecai. Listen, God does indeed have a sense of humor, doesn't he? I love it. Well, Haman later enjoyed the queen's second banquet until Esther exposed his plot to destroy her people. The king left the room in a fury only to return and discover Haman, who appeared to be assaulting his queen. Actually, he stumbled onto her while pleading for his life. King ordered that Haman be impaled on the very pole intended for Mordecai. The king couldn't repeal his original edict declaring the destruction of the Jews, but he enabled Mordecai to issue a counter edict providing for the Jews to take up their own defense. The day planned for destruction became a day of what? Deliverance. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? What a story. Man, that's better than they lived happily ever after. Though the lot was cast, God remained the author of the story. Even in exile, God protected his people. And in Esther, 
We see God's heart for saving us all. So what in the world do you and I learn from the story of Esther? A whole lot. First of all, we learn to trust God's providence. We learn to trust God's providence. And what's the implication of that? Do not fear. No reason to be afraid. Listen, there are times when a set of circumstances come together. Some people would call it coincidence. Others would call it luck. Others would say someone is pulling strings behind the scenes and working out their destiny. Well, Haman rolls the dice and casts the lots, the, the purr, to determine which day the Jews would be exterminated. The roll of the dice was set for 11 months later on Adar the 13th, on which the Jews' destinies would be carried out. But here's what I want you to see. Several things in this story are an apparent role of the dice, but are they? Let me give you a few. Haman from the Amalekites happens to live in Susa and is the king's right-hand man. Haman literally rolls the dice to choose the day of the Jews' extermination. Esther is chosen to try out for queen, and above all things, she makes it. Esther happens to be Jewish and happens to be related to Mordecai, Haman's nemesis. The night Haman builds a pole to impel Mordecai on is a night the king can't sleep. Haman recommends a lavish plan to honor someone, thinking the someone is himself when it's actually for Mordecai, and Haman has to carry it out. Right at the moment, Haman stumbles into Queen Esther as he's pleading for his life. The king walks in. It appears that he's making an advance on his wife. Haman is impelled on the pole that was intended for Mordecai. Looks like this, the, the dice is being rolled. God's behind it all. Most of you know that the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible where God's name is not mentioned. Not one time. But folks, listen, that doesn't mean that He isn't working behind the scenes, caring for His people, working out His upper story plan. At this point, even though 50,000 Israelites have returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, the majority of them are still living in exile in Persia. No matter how bleak, no matter how distant God may seem, He's still at work. Haman rolled the dice, but God determined how the dice would fall. That's in the Bible. Proverbs 16.33 We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Now don't take that to Vegas with you. You with me on that? We can't be careless and reckless with that. But it's still true. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Proverbs 21.1 The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. So we trust God's providence. His ability to see ahead of time. Don't miss this. God sees the end from the beginning and works accordingly. And just as we've seen this truth over and over again in the Old Testament, we hang on to the fact that God is still working even when we can't see His hand or His plan. I've shared a statement with you that a good friend by the name of Jennifer shared with me when you can't see God's hand, trust His heart. See, that's faith. That's the substance of things hoped for. And it's the evidence of things not seen. Do you know this morning that everything that has happened in your past, everything that has brought you to this point in your life has been God ordained. It's not by happenstance. It's not by chance. It's not by role of the dice. It was all part of God's plan to get you where you are today. And do you know that everything that will happen to you in the future is as much in God's hands as the things that have happened in your past? Trust God's provision. There's no reason to fear. Number two, we learn from Esther, to trust God's provision. God always provides. Best seen in that verse that Gordon shared with us when Esther was told, if you don't do it, God will still provide for it. And the implication here is what? Do not fret. 
No need to worry. In the case of Esther and Mordecai, God not only protected, He provided. Boy, all we have to do is look at Matthew 6, 25 through 27, where Jesus said, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. You know, Jesus told us not to worry about that. You notice we worry about that a lot. How much of your life is consumed with eating and what you're going to wear? Jesus said those aren't the most important things in life. It's not life more important than food, the body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your <laughs> Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Rhetorical question. Of course you are. Of course I am. And then that question that we've all grappled with, I know, can any of you by worrying add one single hour to your life again? A question that doesn't need an answer because it's a rhetorical question. Worry accomplishes nothing. Art Linkletter said that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't take you anywhere. That's what it is. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul said, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. The peace of God who transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus says when you're tempted to worry, do what? Trust. Paul says when you're tempted to worry, do what? Pray. Going back to the Ten Boons, it was Corey that said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. How much strength are you losing day after day because you're so consumed with worry? Anyway, Esther's faced with a decision. She knows she can't do this in the flesh. She knows she can't just march into the king's presence. It could be certain death for her. I mean, this is going to take God's wisdom, creativity, and intervention. So recognizing the magnitude of this decision, what does she do? She sends back this message to her cousin Mordecai, who raised her from childhood. In Esther 4, verse 16, you read it this week in your storybook, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, here it is, and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it's against the law. And that's when she said, and if I perish, I perish. Praise God, Esther made the right choice. And this wasn't, I might lose a friendship. It wasn't, it might cost me my job. This was life or death. And God has placed her there to intercede for his people. Not only is Esther beautiful on the outside, more importantly, she's beautiful on the inside as this wise woman invites, invites God into the process. Praying and fasting went hand in hand for the Jewish people. And that was the first thing that Esther thought about. I suspect we ought to fast more than we do, don't you think? <coughs> I would suspect that fasting is probably one of those... Uh, unexperienced disciplines that the Bible talks about. What in the world is fasting? Well, when you, when you skip a meal or you decide to skip several meals, you're communicating that God's going to be your nourishment. God's going to be your strength. You're going without food to express your dependence and your desperation on the Lord, but what you're doing is you are declaring for all to hear, God will provide. And in those moments of truth that you face, what are you going to do? Are you going to take a stand? Are you going to do what's right? Furthermore, what's the first thing you do when you face intense pressure? Normally we don't fast. Normally we don't even pray. But Esther did. Some people turn to a chemical. Some people get angry. Some people work longer hours. Some people just go spend money. Some people just hole up and hide out in their home. But what are we to do? I like 1 Peter 5, verse 7, where we're told this, cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. 
give over your anxiety, give over your worry to God because He really does care for you. And we'd be wise when we face intense situations to do what Esther did, what Esther asked of others to do on her behalf, and that is to really fast and to really pray so that we can stand up for what's right regardless, regardless of the consequences. The final lesson that we learned from Esther is we trust God's promise. We sang about that this morning. We trust God's promise. And the implication here is, do not falter. That's a word that we don't use very much, but it just means to weaken in purpose or action. To just wear down. But we don't do that because we, we trust God's promise. We can take a courageous stand like Esther and Mordecai, knowing that life may sometimes look bleak and look like the roll of the dice, but God is behind the scenes working all things out for good. Does that sound familiar? Romans 8, 28, my favorite verse in the Bible. We know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. God always works for our good. And I know we don't always understand what His good is. And check it out. Sometimes His good is what we think is our good. Did you catch that? What we think is best... God may not think His best at all. But just like God watched over the Israelites, God promises to watch over His people, the church, those who are in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells us that all the Old Testament feasts were what? A shadow of what was to come. Colossians 2, don't, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival. Here it is. These are a shadow of the thing that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. found in Christ. There it is again. Once again, a shadow of the Messiah appears. And this time it's through a woman. God's chosen people experienced a miraculous day of deliverance. Just as Moses led them from Egypt after the death of the firstborn to establish Passover Esther's courage leads to what's called the establishment of the Feast of Purim, the Festival of the Dice, a celebration of delivery. The Jews still celebrate this feast today with great joy and gladness. In fact, next month, March 9th and 10th, the Feast of Purim will be held again. And the book of Esther will be read in the synagogue. People will dress in costumes representing Esther and Mordecai and Haman and King Xerxes. Esther's delivery of her people is another royal precursor to Jesus Himself. Think about it this way. Sin rolled the dice and ordered the day of our death. But on the ultimate day of judgment, instead of us being thrown into the lake of fire, sin and death will be thrown into the lake of fire instead, just like the Haman and Mordecai story. See, in Jesus, the tables are turned. Don't believe me? Revelation 20, verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Man, that's good. That's good. Just when it looks like, by chance, it's going to go bad. God turns the tables and works out His upper story. Let's close with that statement that Gordon made reference to in Esther 4, verse 14. For he remains silent at this time. Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. You are not who you are, where you are, doing what you do, going through what you're going through by chance. Mordecai saw that Esther was not in the palace due to some random roll of the dice. God has an upper story plan to keep Israel alive, and He's going to do it one way or another. His upper story cannot be thwarted. God has positioned Esther in an unlikely place for a Hebrew orphan girl, not because of her beauty, but because God wants to use her to accomplish His purpose for such a time as this. 
Esther was brought to this place by God to sustain the Jewish people so that the Messiah can be born through that line. Think about it. 1,520 years has indulged God's memory. God uses Esther to carry through on a promise that He made to Abraham that many years ago. I mean, what's that say to us today? That we are players on a bigger stage. We're involved in something bigger. God's upper story that is so much greater than you and me. And guess what? It isn't just about you and me. It's about Him and what He's trying to do. So the implication is simply this. God has, has you where you are for such a time as this. Start looking at it that way. What's the current fear that you're facing right now that's stirring up the kind of anxiety that the Jewish people faced as they anticipated Adar the 13th? We've learned that no matter what the situation for followers of Jesus, God is in control, working behind the scenes so that the dice ultimately fall in our favor. When you feel like the deck is stacked against you, let God play out His hand. When you feel like you're in an unfair game, just let God play out His hand. Trust Him for provision. Trust Him for promises. Trust Him for His plan that He has for your life. What a great story, huh? Just a vivid reminder that we just don't go aimlessly through this life. God is directing our path. God has brought you where you are today. Where do you need to go from here? What is your next step?